Well, hello once again, everybody. It's so good to see everybody. Sometimes we edit the other part of the service, so I want to welcome everyone that's watching us later on. My name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here. And if this is your first time here at Cornerstone Church, thank you for being our guest. And I've seen some of you I have not seen in over a year, and it's so good to see you back. Come on, let's give a big welcome back. I'm going to start singing that song from the 70s, Welcome Back. Okay, but I'm not going to do it. I'm dating myself again. I'm having so much fun going back to all the TV land themes of the past. Hey, it's so good to see everyone. We are in the middle of a series called Unshakable, and what we're dealing with primarily is the book of 1 Peter, and 1 Peter is one of the apostles of Jesus, writes a letter to a church that is scattered through the modern-day Turkey area today and Israel and all those other areas that is a Jewish sect of, of Judaism, that's being persecuted. I don't know if you realize everybody, but Christianity has Jewish origins. In fact, Jesus is Jewish even today. And the first Christians were Jewish. And so when you see anti-Semitic things going on in our cities and around the world, we have to stand up and say that's wrong. And we have to pray and protect the Jewish people because us that are not Jewish have been grafted in. And so remember that, everybody. And so they were Jewish. And, and what happened was they were, they were scattered abroad. The, the, what happened was the people that believed in Christ were being persecuted by the Jewish people. They are being persecuted by the Romans. And now there's a guy by the name of Nero who came into power. And pretty soon he's going to completely lose his mind and really start killing the Christians. And we talked about that in previous weeks. And so today we're going to be talking about primarily is what the purpose of life is. We, when you're going through difficult sets of circumstances, you need to know why you are alive. And think about it for a moment. Imagine someone tells you, I want you to get up at 5 o'clock every single day. I want you to eat tofu burgers. <laughs> and I want you to run five miles a day. And I want you to exercise six days a week, four hours a day. For what reason? I don't know, just to do it. I mean, what's the motivation? But if you know that you are going to play, you're going to honor your country in the Olympics and you're, you're a triathlete and you know you need to practice, there's a purpose behind it, right? And so all that pain has a direction. All that pain means something. And so many times we don't know what we do, what we do, and the purpose of life. So what is the meaning and what is the purpose of life? It's important we know what it is. And I like one of the verses it says in Scripture, I think this is a good way for us to believe in Jesus Christ. And maybe you're checking it out. Maybe you're trying to figure out if, if God is real. And listen, you're welcome here. I went through the process myself where I wondered, is there a God? And I want to let you know that God does exist. He loves you through Jesus Christ. And we are sharing what this means for us today. And so whether we are at home or away, we make our aim to please him. I want to please God. It's not about pleasing me, even though I want to please me. It's about pleasing God. And actually, a better description of it is this. And this is this verse put into a, more, a bigger context. The goal of my life is to know and love God in a growing relationship that pleases God. It's not just trying to get God to be pleased. That's not what it's about. But to live a relationship with God where we are pleasing him. We're doing what he's called us to do. And he has good plans for us. And so we're okay with this kind of goal, right? But as we continue on, how about this goal? If this is the goal of your life, what do you think of this one? To love life and see good days. Hey, you like that one? I like that one pretty good, right? I, sh I should write a book and go on a speaking, speaking circuit, right? To, hey, it's all about loving life and seeing good days. And by the way, that's a good thing. You know why? It's in Scripture. That's right. It says in 1 Peter 3.10, for whoever desires to love life and see good days. So if you guys love life, if you desire to love life and see good days, this is for you today. If it's not for you, then you can, you can tune out. Is there anyone here today that does not want to love life and see good days? This is for you then. Okay? So what we're going to do right now is just review for a few moments and, and what the goal of our life is and what we've been talking about throughout this series We've been talking about what it means to be a believer. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and read what this passage of Scripture is. We're going to read through it first, and we're going to go back line by line, verse by verse. That's what we've been doing. We've been going through the book of 1 Peter, and I don't know when we're going to finish it. 
but we're going through line by line, verse by verse. I think it's important to do that at different times to let the scriptures speak to us, to bring up topics we don't necessarily want to bring up on our own. But let's go ahead and read this. I want to go back and go through it line by line. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, the, bless for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, right, let him or her keep his or her tongue from evil and his or her lips from speaking deceit. Let him or her turn away from evil and do good. Let him or her seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there? Now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord as holy. So we're going to break this down today, how to live and how to have better days. So our identity determines our destiny. This whole series has been about that. In fact, I will tell you right now, since you were born, you've been trying to figure out what your identity is, right? It really is true. And make no mistake, if, if your identity is attacked, you can lose the purpose of life. So our objective is to bring people to Jesus because when you know who Jesus is, you begin to know your identity. When you know your identity, you can become who you're called to become. And that's the best thing to do. And the only way you're really going to know your identity is knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. And this is what the Bible says. We've been going through it. One of the theme verses in 1 Peter is this. But you are a chosen race, a royal... You guys are chosen. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I don't want to be in darkness. I want to be in light, right? Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. So we've been talking about this the last couple of weeks and what that all means. What does it mean to go through all this? And so what Peter does in this verse we have to understand that we must go to war against the sin. We go to war against your sin because your sin is at war with you. You have to understand it, everybody. One of the most important things you can learn in life is that your problem is not someone else's. It's yours. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. In fact, I will tell you today that your greatest enemy probably isn't even the devil. It's yourself. Until you, know, you and I realize that the biggest adversary we face is ourselves, and until we conquer ourselves and the sin within us, we're always going to be struggling. So we must go to war against your sin because your sin is at war against you. Make no mistake about it. And so we talked about that. And, and so what Peter did is he broke it down for us. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So the first one we do, we go to war against your sin because your sin's at war against you. And then we talk about this. Do what is right even when treated wrong. We have to do what is right. Now the apostle Peter talked about these various areas. We fleshed out what it means to interact with society that treats you poorly. In fact, all of these examples have been abusive. For example, civil government was abusive back in those days. They were killing Christians. They were arresting Christians. You were losing things, right? So we must obey civil government. We talked about that the first week. Then we talked about slavery. Yeah, we got into slavery, okay, which is your boss, right? We got into Jesus and how Jesus learned what he suffered. And we also got into wives. That's right. What's a woman's place in the home? And what's a man's place in the home? We talked about those things. So today we continue on, and we're going to be talking about what's the most important aspect of our lives to help us to live a life that is worth living, to love life and enjoy our days. 
So our deepest joys and our most painful hurts come through relationships. Is that not true? In fact, Jesus died for you so you can have a relationship. Everything about God is about relationship. You see, the problem with religion and the problem with religiosity is it's all about obeying the rules. But the rules is not why Jesus died. Jesus died that you and I would have a relationship with him. The rules are there to protect the relationship, to make sure you get all the benefit out of that relationship. So the rules are there to help us. But if the rules become the end game, it's destructive. So our deepest joys come, and the most painful hurts come through relationships. Also, your life is shaped by your relationships. So today, we're going to look at what it means to deal with difficult people. Is there anyone today ever deal with difficult people? No? Have you, ever, <laughs> have you ever been misunderstood by a friend? No. Have you ever been hurt by what another person said about you? Thank you. <laughs> have you ever felt like <laughs> you, not been, you have not been heard by another person after you spent so much time explaining yourself? No, of course not. Have you ever been betrayed? I had a pastor friend talk to me this past week, and he said he had someone in his church for 30 years. He said, Pastor, I'll never leave you. I love you. And when I die, this is what they said, when I die, bury me in the parking lot. <laughs> well, the guy left the church last week. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, I was upset with the pastor. So, yeah, that happens, right? That's right. Have you ever worked hard? Have you ever had to work hard through misunderstanding? No matter how hard you try, they still didn't get it right. Yeah. Have you ever experienced loneliness because of a broken relationship? I mean, we're going through all these things here. Have you ever felt a grudge towards somebody? Have you ever felt used? Have you ever been not able to solve a conflict? Of course, all of us have gone through painful relationships. Sometimes I want to check out of relationships. Sometimes I've had enough of relationships, but there's a problem with that. You and I are designed to be in relationship with God and relationship with each other. In fact, the two greatest thoughts, that you could, two greatest commandments are this, that you would love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and you would love your neighbor as yourself. If we do those two things, it solves every other problem in life. How easy is that, everybody? Not easy, but it's simple, right? So God wants us to love him and when we love him, we're loved by him. And when we're loved by him, we feel love, and we can show love to each other. So we talk about that as well. So let's continue on. I want to show you something here very interesting. I, I found this article in the last couple of weeks about a woman who died in California in the San Francisco Bay Area, and her children were gracious enough to put an obituary in about her life. I want to, it's, so, it's so encouraging. I thought on this wonderful, beautiful, rainy Memorial Day weekend, I thought I could read you something to cheer you up. You ready? Okay, here we go. Marianne Johnson Reddick, born January 4th, 1935, and died alone on September 30th, 2013. She is survived by six of her eight children, whom she spent her lifetime torturing in every way possible. While she neglected and abused her small children, she refused to show anyone else to care or show compassion towards them. When they became adults, she stalked and tortured anyone they dared to love. Everyone she met, adult or child, was tortured by her cruelty and exposed to violence, criminal activity, vulgarity, and hatred of the gentle, kind human spirit. On, on behalf of her children, whom she abrasively exposed to her evil and violent life, we celebrate her passing from this earth and hope she lives in the life, afterlife, re reliving each ge gesture of violence, cruelty, and shame that she de delivered on each of her children. That's so hard to read. This is so, so horrible. Her surviving children will now live the rest of their lives with the peace of knowing their nightmare has some form of closure. Now, isn't that wonderful? And actually, this is true. And her, her son was on a talk show, and he says, ding dong, the witch is dead. Now, that's what you call a bad relationship, right? Maybe some of you have experienced something like that. I mean, we, we laugh about it, it's so horrible. But maybe you experienced such kind of abuse. Maybe you grew up in a home where you were told horrible things like that. 
And some of you can, can relate to that type of thing. Well, how do we work through these relationships? How do we heal those relationships? If you've been wrong, you've been hurt, well, to love life and to see good days, what do we have to do? We have to work hard at unity with other Christians. Why not the world? I understand that, but it starts with the churches first. If you're a Christian, a Christ follower, relationships begin with you and God and then the church first. How can that be? Well, let me explain to you for a few moments. You think of the Ten Commandments, right? Love your Lord your God, all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. It tells you to love God first, right? And then what's the first commandment with, with dealing with people? It says, children, honor your mother and father that it may go well with you. Because if your child cannot honor the authority in the home, it will not honor the authority outside the home. Okay? And if you can't get your relationship right with God here and in your family and in the church here where we practice, then who on earth wants to be a part of this, this community? Because Jesus has not given us the option to live a life separated from each other. We are called the body of Christ. And we need to work together. We need to be together. And the only way we're really going to see the earth change is that you and I change and that we love each other well, then the world is looking for love. The world is looking for a community of believers or people that love each other. I mean, look at the violence. Look at the hatred out there. Look at all the problems out there, right? The church should be the place where it is a loving community that multiplies. And this is what God would have us to do. So, in 1 Peter 3, 8, it says this. Finally, all of you. He talked about all these other people. He talked about the government. Talk about slaves and masters. Talk about Jesus. Talk about husbands. Talk about wives. Now we say, hey, for the rest of you, this is what I'm telling you, all of you, you need to have what? Unity of mind. What does unity of mind mean? It means thinking the same thing. What? Yeah. L let me give an example. If you've ever seen an orchestra play, you ever see that they're all tuning up their instruments, a lot of noise, and then the conductor goes, and they all, they're all quiet, right? They watch the conductor, and what do they do? They play off the same sheet of music. And because they play off the same sheet of music, they're not playing what they desire to play, they're playing what's on the page. My friends, we need to play off the same scripture. It's called the Word of God. We need to make that uh, the, the most important thing that we do next to knowing Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we are unified on the essential issues. The essential issue is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. There's only one way, one truth, one life. No one comes to the Father except through him. We believe the Bible is the word of God. We believe there's a heaven. We believe there's a hell, right? Those are the things we should be completely together on, the same sheet of music. But the secondary issues, the issues of how you are to worship, these issues about all these other things are not important. I don't know if you recognize, I'm not going to give any examples of what has happened in the last 15 months. I'm not going to give any examples. But uh, why would we divide over things that are not essential, right? We have to have unity of mind. We have to start here, okay? And there's more we can speak about that. So we need to be in unity of mind and also have sympathy. What sympathy is feeling someone else's pain? I even hear someone say, never judge a man or a woman until you walk in their moccasins. Well, first of all, I don't have a pair of moccasins. <laughs> if you want to buy me a pair, I might use them. And that is a fallacy at best. That doesn't even work. That's the problem. The problem is I'm walking in your shoes, but the problem, I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about me and your situation. For, give you, let me give you an example. Suppose for a moment that my wife has to work till 1130 at night and I don't do the dishes, all the lights aren't on the house, all the kids are on their devices, and it's a school day. I'm thinking, eh, they're at home anyhow. It doesn't make a difference to me. If I were her, it wouldn't bother me. But if I'm my wife, I would know that's important to her. So guess what I need to do? Thank you. Right? I got to think what's important to her. And do I always do that? No. And neither do you. But that's what we got to do. We got to think about the other person. What do they think? Have sympathy. What are they going through? Just because you are not going through it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. 
So stop thinking about you in that set of circumstances. Start thinking about that person or that group of people in that set of circumstances. That's what Jesus did to us. He became one of us. He died for us, right? He became one of us. He identified with the accused. And that's what you and I are to do. So sympathy. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I've had the strange day of being at a birthing, uh, visiting someone just after they had a baby. And they tried for such a long time they had a baby. We were rejoicing in the same day going to a hospice and seeing someone take their last breath and crying with the family. And learning, and there's such joy in being able to cry together and celebrate together. That's the beauty of rejoicing with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love. That means, hey, we're family. Right? You ever watch The Godfather? Yeah, we're family. I'm Italian, okay, and German. Italians know how to make cement shoes. And Germans know how to calculate it to make the perfect mixture. A deadly combination. And I can say it because I'm Italian and German. All right, thank you. The other servers thought it was funny, but you guys don't. All right, finally, all of you have unity of mind. There must be a lot of Italians in here. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love. Now, what does that mean, brotherly love? <laughs> well, love is a choice. It's not just a feeling. If I feel like love, I'll do it. I fell out of love. I fell in love. It's so wimpy. It's, I mean, a real man or a real woman does not live their life that way, how they feel. Now, does love contain feelings? Absolutely. Are feelings important? Yes. Are they absolutely the, the end all get all? No. You see, love's a choice. Feelings are dependent on the renewing of the choice. I choose to love even if I don't feel like it. That's real love. Anyone can love when the things are going well. But real love sacrifices. Real love is a choice. And we are to love each other, brotherly love, that you love one another. A new commandment, a new commandment. What does commandment mean, everybody? Have to, right? I give to you that you would love one another just as I've loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If the outside world sees the church, even in our own community, I can't control what goes on out there, but I think we can do a little better job here. Let's love each other well, right? They see that. Okay? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That means loving you when you're not so lovely. That means you loving me when I'm not so lovely. Why? We have brotherly love. We are family. I'm not going to sing the song. All my brothers, sisters, and me. It's like name that tune. Anyhow. So we choose to love each other regardless. You know what makes a, 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 you know it makes a great life? Having relationships you, you are committed to. That you are my friend until the day I die. And if, if something goes on with your children, I'll look after your kids. I mean, what would it be like if we lived a life like that? I'll tell you what it would be, a life worth living. But right now, I'll cancel you the moment I don't like what you say. Canceled unfriended, goodbye. What kind of life is that? The church is different. We don't have, the, we don't have the, the luxury to cancel each other. We should love each other. So by this, all people would know if you love one another. Finally, all of you have this have the unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, and a tender heart. Can I be a little transparent with you today? Uh, just past week, there was another shooting in California. Some guy came into his workplace and, sh and killed people. And, and everyone's like, oh. and even myself, I'm like, oh, well, another shooting. I'm like, wait a minute here. Another shooting. Why am I getting used to this? Why am I becoming calloused? I have no emotion toward this because I hear it all the time. And I go, God, please, would you break my heart? God, I, I don't want my heart to become calloused because I know, God, this breaks your heart. I should care if things are like this are going on in our culture today. Right? And so I'm asking God to change my heart. I'm asking God. I start focusing on it. I start reading about the families. I want to feel the pain. Because if I don't care, no one cares. It goes on and on and on. 
We have to care. I, we need to have a tender heart. Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion, and he moved. And here's another one, a humble mind. A humble mind means you don't know everything. The older I get, the more education I get, the more I read, the more, the closer I get to God, the less confidence I have in myself. And the more I realize how desperately I need the Lord Jesus Christ. And it keeps me humble. A humble mind is so essential. Live in harmony with one another. Harmony means, harmony, you may not have the same note, but at least work together. Different gifts working together with one another. Do not be what? Proud. But be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. The church is not a country club. I want everyone to look like me. I want everyone to drive the same cars I have, have the same skin color I have. I want to, no, this is not a country club. God forbid this ever becomes a country club. If it does, I'll resign now. We don't want a country club. This is a family. This is a church that works together. We should have a variety of different people from a variety of backgrounds helping each other, different cultures, different ethnicities, different social economic stratuses, if you will. But we are family, and we must work together. This is what the Word of God says. Do not be conceited. What would the world do if they came into a place where everyone loves each other and no one thinks they're better than anyone else? Everyone celebrates each other. Everyone helps everyone else to achieve. We don't compete against each other, but we complete each other. What a community that is. That's the church. And this is what we're called to be. So, you want to, you want to, you want to love life and see good days? Work hard at unity with other Christians. Also, treat those right who treat you wrong. This is a toughie. I'm going to be transparent again. Yeah, this is like a confessions of a pastor. Confessions. Uh, I don't like, I get a little funny sometimes when I'm in the car. I have to be honest with you. I, sometimes I, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I used to have an ichthus in my car. I took it off, okay? I should probably drive with a clerical collar. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> Just kidding, but no, not really. But anyhow, uh, I don't like when people tailgate me. It usually irritates me, okay? Especially when there's an 18-wheeler behind me with bald tires. I'm bald as it is. I don't need bald tires behind me with a truck. So I'm driving down the road, and there's this truck on my tail. And, you know, and my family, we're on vacation together. We're going down the road. My wife's like, would you please me? No, he needs to learn a lesson. My wife's like, would you please pull over the... No, honey, I need to teach him a lesson. How am I going to teach an 18-wheeler a lesson? So what do I do? I, I, I go faster, and then I, what I do is I put one, one foot on the gas and one on the brake, and I go slow and I go fast to try to make him jackknife. <laughs> I'm sick, I'm sadistic, and I need Jesus. But all kidding aside, you know, sometimes I get that way, right? And that's not right, right? Treat others right. When they treat you wrong, it's easy to do that. I'm giving an example. Guys, give me some grace. You guys are so holy. You never do anything like that, right? Boy, I'm such a wreck, and you guys are having a great time at my expense. But all kidding aside, I mean, when someone treats you wrong, the natural knee-jerk reaction is to fight back, and we do it at home. I do it. If she does me wrong or he does me wrong, either I'm going to give you a tongue lashing or I'm going to turn into foreigner. I'm going to be as cold as ice, willing to sacrifice our love. I never pay the price. But someday you'll know. Anyhow, but that's what happens, right? We, pull, we, we give the ice treatment or the ice ice baby, right? We do that. I'm having a good time here today, folks. It's the third service. It's the Memorial Day weekend, and I need you to laugh. Okay. <laughs> treat those right who treat you wrong even when things go bad. we got to be able to do that. Do not repay evil for evil. That never works. Never works. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless. For this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. You know what the word blessing in the Greek there means? It actually, we get the word eulogy. You know what a eulogy is? Ever been to a funeral? Yeah. They eulogize somebody. And usually at a, at a funeral, I've known some people really, really well. I've been to a funeral. Like, well, who are they talking about, right? 
who's this person? <laughs> and so a eulogy, what you do is you usually highlight the positives of someone's life. You talk about all the good things that they do. You eulogize. You speak well of. Well, the Bible is saying we are to eulogize each other, not so we can go, not to put each other in a casket, but to speak well of each other. Speak well of each other. In fact, it reminds me of a story of these two, these two scoundrels that lived in this little town, these two guys. They were, all their lives, they were cheating people. They had a lot of money. They would foreclose on people's homes. They were terrible people. They were lousy people in the community. Everyone li- hated these two brothers, and they were getting along in age, and one of them died. So one of the brothers goes to the pastor in town who's new. He says, Pastor, I, I need you to do a funeral for my brother. He says, Sure but I need you to say good things about it. You need to say that he's a saint. And by the way, I'm writing you a check for $35,000 that I will give to you if you do this stream the right way. The pastor looking at his building program saying, took the check. And so the following, week, a couple days later, the whole town showed up. They wanted to see what was going to happen. And so the pastor gets up there and he says, he began, you know that the departed was an individual who robbed cheated, swindled, and stole from everyone he ever did business with. But compared to his brother, he's a saint. (laughs) So, thank you. Eulogize. All right. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but bless for for, to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. I want God to eulogize me. I want God to say good things about me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy today. I want to hear God say, as he said to Jesus, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want to hear God say, because you have asked for forgiveness, I forgive you. You, I love you. You're my son. I want to hear those words from God. If you want to hear those words from God, give those words to other people. Come on, you, you parents out there, hello. If the kids are insulting each other, are you going to be having a good time with your kids? No, but if your children are blessing the other child, little Johnny's blessing Susie in the back seat on the drive to vacation, and they're not asking, what, are we there yet? They're saying, we're loving this trip. Take as long as you want. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. That you may attain a blessing. You know, it's kind of funny. I was in India one time. We were traveling, uh, and the missionaries were taking us in, the, in this Land Rover. We we're going through this area, and I hear the kids speaking a different language in back Hindi or whatever. I said, what are they saying? They're asking if we're there yet. I'm like, it's just the way it is. <laughs> so 1 Peter 3.10, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. Are we speaking evil? Are we saying things that are wretched and negative? Listen, I, we all do it, right? And his lips from speaking deceit and lies. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. My friends, we have to seek peace and we have to pursue peace. It does not happen by itself. Bring peace. Bring peace to a relationship. Peace. It's not easy. You have to pursue it. You have to replace hostility with peace. In fact, there's a principle When we stop a bad behavior, we should pursue and replace it with a good one. So if we want to pursue, if there's hostility, pursue with peace. For example, it says in the scriptures, therefore, having put away falsehood, if if your people lie, what do you do? Let each of you, what? Speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Let Let the thief no longer steal. See, if you take something away and don't replace it, what you took away even gets worse. There is a cavity that will break. You need to fill it with something else. So let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Only such is good for the building up. You see? So no corrupting talk. I'm not going to talk how bad it is. I can't believe how bad it is. It's hot in here. This person, why not? You know what? We're so blessed that we have a roof over our heads. I'm so blessed that we're eating the spam. (laughs) Thank God we have spam. All right, I mean, seriously, thank God for what you have. Good for building up, as fits the occasion that they may give grace to those who hear it. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away. Okay, what's the opposite of that? Let's fill it with something else. Instead, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, 
as God in Christ forgave you. So we replace it with what's good. It goes against what we feel. If possible, so as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Sometimes it's not possible. But, but if, all, if all you can, try to live peaceful with everyone you can. <laughs> Why should we live peacefully when it's not easy? That's a good question. It's, it's hard work. You know, it's easier just to, it's easier to ignore the person. It's easier to write the person off. It's easier to talk about the person when they're not around. Easier to get on the phone. It's easier to get on social media and go off about people. Not even say the person's name, but describe the circumstances in such a way that everyone knows exactly who you're talking about and then deny it. No one does that here, right? Okay. Four, the eyes, why? For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. Do you want God to hear your prayers? You know, it said in the previous verse, in, in, in 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Husbands, treat your wives properly so the Lord will hear your prayers. We treat people like trash. We treat people in the church like trash. Why is God going to listen to us? I'm not talking about earning salvation. I'm talking about earning God's favor. Come on, parents, you're out there. If the kids are not acting, why are you going to give them extra things, right? Well, God's the same way. His ears are open to the prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Generally speaking, if you're trying to do good to other people, generally speaking, they're going to treat you good back, normally. Now, there are occasions that's not going to happen, but generally speaking, especially within the body of Christ, it should be that way, right? What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us. If I am doing right before God, I really don't need to worry about what other people think ultimately, right? Because all that matters is God. I mean, how much easier is it to live that way? So to love life and see good days, we need to work hard at unity with other Christians. We need to treat those right who treat us wrong. And boy, it's not easy, especially with people who are close to you. And finally, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So we wanted to bring peace to relationships. We wanted to do what Christ has done. Look what it says in the Bible. We talked about this blessed. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, and by the way, sometimes you will suffer for doing the right thing. But even if you should suffer for righteous sake, you will be blessed. Now the word blessed here in the Greek means to be built up. It means to be lifted up. So we, this is what we have. We have this. If we treat people well, God will eulogize us. He'll speak good about us, and he'll lift us up. Now, how many want to be lifted up and be spoken good about God? Okay, all four of you. Fantastic. <laughs> have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Don't worry about everyone else if you are right with God. Honor God. Do all you can do. Even if you do everything right, people are still not going to like you. Jesus was perfect, and they still killed Jesus. It's just going to happen. Okay? we got to bless. we got to build up. And what's the worst thing that can happen to you by the person mistreating you? You die and go to heaven. Ain't so bad, right? The blessing of God is far greater than any harm that can be done to you. The blessing of God is far greater than any harm, not being recognized, the other person getting a, a promotion for utilizing your work and not giving you credit. It's so much better. The blessing of God is far greater than any harm that can be done to you. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. How do we love life and see good days? I want to love life and see good days. Do you not? Well, this is the truth of the matter. God's ways work. You can love life and see good days no matter how bad the days are. Because your day is not based on this day. Your day is based on someday, which gives you hope for today and life for today. You've heard me say it if you've been in this church any period of time. The best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. 
we are passing through. This is not heaven. So work hard at unity with others, Christians. Treat those who treat you wrong well. And follow Jesus. Don't fear anyone else. If you fear man, you'll fear everything else. If you fear God, you have nothing left to fear. Think about that. Anytime you start feeling that way, you know the problem is. I'm not fearing God enough because I care more about what people think about me than what I do. You, you want one that's really, you want a good test? If you do things in private when no one else is around because you don't want to get caught or want to be seen as bad, and you, and, okay, imagine that. You, you don't, you, certain things you just don't do when people know when you're doing it. But do you realize that God is always there? So, if my behavior in secret is different than my behavior with other people around, that means I fear man more than I fear God. How much better is it to live a life that I fear God more than man? And I'm going to do it right because God is right. Much better way to live, everybody. Much better way to live. It's what Jesus says. It's one of the most important verses in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Is this. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You want to have peace? Okay? In this world, you'll have tribulation. You'll have, to have trouble in this world. Can't you be more positive, Pastor? I'm positive in this world you're going to have tribulation. <laughs> you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This is not it. In this world, there's going to be broken relationships, even if you do everything right. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. But guess what? Be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. And we, through him and in him, we have peace and hope both now and forevermore. That's good news, everybody. You're amen. I mean, I'm, I'm preaching a lot better than you're amening me. Come on. And that's not for my ego. That's the truth, everybody. This is the truth. We need to know it. Okay? Work hard at unity with other Christians. Treat those right who treat you wrong. Follow Jesus. Don't fear anyone else. And this is how we're going to love life and see good days. And finally, I want to mention this to you. I like the first part of this verse. The second one I don't like. But guess what? It's the whole package. It's this. That I may know him the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. The truth of the matter is, that's the fullness of God. That's why the first martyr of the church, Stephen, where he's being, stones are being hurled at him, he's being killed, he saw the glory of God and he forgave the people that were doing it to him. He was not subject to the suffering he received. He was beyond that because he was completely sold out to God. I don't know what kind of days will be coming to our world. But today is the day to get ourselves right, to train ourselves, because difficult days are on their way. And we should be ready and be well trained. So when the day comes, we won't falter, but we'll be strong in the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for this word, Lord. I know it's not... It's nothing perhaps we never heard before. But Lord, I confess, we confess, it's not like we need more information, but we need, to, we need to do what we know is right. Father, we need to put into practice what we already know. And Father, I pray that we would be a people that would honor you, God, that we would treat people right, Father God. Father, that we would not to return evil for evil. And that, Lord, that we would serve you knowing that in the end, we will win in all things. So, Father, I ask your blessing right now for those that are struggling in their relationships. Lord, I even pray for marriages to be healed. Lord, I just believe there's someone here today that needs to make an appointment with a counselor for themselves first to realize that they're the problem. That's for somebody today. Lord, that marriages will be healed. Reconciliation between brothers and sisters, between church people members and friends. Father, we pray for healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God, we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask you another question. I ask everyone this question 
every time we get together. And this is what I ask you. How are you with Jesus? It's not about Cornerstone Church. It's not about joining a church. How are you with Jesus? The good news is the best news in the world. I never get tired of saying it. You know what the, new, you know what the good news is? I'm not good enough, and neither are you. We all fail. How's that good news? It's phenomenal news because none of us can save ourselves. We're all hopeless without God. But in our hopelessness, Jesus came and died for us so we all can be accepted and not canceled. It's because of Jesus Christ. And what he's asking you to do, he's asking you to surrender your life and saying, God, this is not my life anymore. Now, listen, if you're struggling with your faith, you're still welcome to be in this church. I went through a period of time where I struggled with my faith. I had to work out some issues. But listen, Jesus died for us. He loves us. He has a good plan for us. So you can never measure up, but he measures up for you. So what do you have to do? You have to accept the gift he's given you. He's died on the cross for you. So you could have fellowship with him, uh, the ultimate relationship. But you have to be willing to surrender your life to him. And saying, God, I give you my whole life. Not just part of my life. You have to be willing to give it all. It's not easy, but it's, ref it's refreshing. It's the right thing to do. If you're not willing to give it all, then you're not really a believer. Jesus, it, 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 it costs Jesus everything. It's free, but it costs him everything. And you and I have to be willing to say, I'm giving my entire life to God right now. Are you going to blow it along the way? Of course you're going to blow it. But you make a decision, a, def a definitive decision. I'll give my life to Jesus. If you'd like to do that today, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to lead you into prayer. And this is a prayer of new beginnings. A prayer of giving your life to Jesus to get right with God. Because one day you're going to have to stand before God. And the only way you have a right to be in God, be with Him forever in a place called heaven, instead of eternal separation in a place called hell, is through Jesus Christ. Hell is doing it your own way. Heaven is doing it God's way. And so if you'd like to give your life to Christ, you can just pray this prayer after me in, your, in the heart. Just agree with it in your heart. Say it in your own mind. Lord Jesus, that's right. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins, all the things I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you. I give you my whole life the best way I know how. My life is your life now. Come fill me now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or make a new commitment, you have begun a new journey. You are a child of God. Now, Jesus does not say, come say a prayer after me and you're good to go. No. That's what he says. Come follow me. We are a church that endeavors to follow God together. And so I'm on a journey. We're on a journey together. We're on a pilgrimage together. We want to welcome you to become a part of it. In the front pocket of your seat, there's, there's a card, a connection card. Also, on the screen behind me, there should be a phone number. You can text a number. Text to um, 860-499-4888 and text BELIEVE. We'll help you with the next steps of your life. Amen, everybody? Hey, before we leave here today, I want to give you an opportunity to continue to give to what we're doing here. You don't have to give, but you get to give. And by the way, thank you, Cornerstone Church. More money came in. We're able to give $30,000 to bring relief to the nation of India through churches, bringing oxygenators and oxygen tanks. Thank you, Cornerstone, for, for heeding to that need. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And the Bible says, my God shall supply all of your needs. And the context of that is being generous. So these are the four different ways you can give. You can give to Cornerstone Cheshire, 77977, the PushPay app, cornerstonecheshire.com. Or as you walk out of here today, there are boxes in the back. You can put your offerings there. Listen, you don't have to give, but you get to give. Let me tell you something right now. God has always taken care of us when we put him first with our giving. It just works. It's supernatural. All right, everybody. Hey, before we leave here today, we're going to have some folks up front if you need prayer for anything at all. In the meantime, I want to just to say two other things. We have a first Wednesday, this Wednesday, at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. where special guests will be with us. I'm excited about that. And then we have a prayer meeting on Friday, every Friday at 12 noon. All right, everybody, let me just say a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with love, joy, peace, 
patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Walk in the grace of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen? Amen. Amen.